Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Joy Sharp. Uh, Joy lives in Ridgeway, Colorado, which is a beautiful little town in southwestern Colorado near Telluride and Ure, where I've spent some time camping myself. And um, I met Joy in person recently at an uh, AMA event, AMA the Hugging Saint, here in Iowa. And I've seen you around over the years anyway at AMA events. You're not, you're yeah. not, yeah. Your face is familiar. So welcome, Joy. Thank you. Hi, Rick. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Um, someone actually <coughs> recommended you. I think it might have been a friend of ours named Jill. I don't know if you know Jill. Um, or maybe it was yeah. Radhika. I don't know. But I think it was Radhika. <laughs> okay, yeah, she I had mentioned this. Yeah, I get these recommendations, yeah. and I, I sort of prioritize these interviews based upon kind of a mixture of how many votes people get from various people recommending people and also just sort of a gut yeah. instinct, you know, but right. I, I kind of got a good gut instinct when <laughs> you came to my attention. Well, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. We're off to a good start then. Yeah. And yeah. Um, over the last, since I saw you last a uh, week ago, I've listened to a, a couple of your sat songs on audio. They're about an hour and a half each. And for, yes. those, for those listening, uh, I should say that there's a whole bunch of them on Joy's website, which I'll be linking to. And uh, I... I was impressed. I mean, it always impresses me when people can just sit there and rap for an hour and not say <laughs> the same thing twice, basically. I don't know how people yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, Sometimes it's, I wonder when it's going to stop, but it just keeps on coming out. Yeah, and, and then eventually, and I haven't listened to all of them. Maybe if I had, I'd find you repeating yourself. But um, it all seemed pretty fresh and original and from the heart and uh, Wonderful. enjoyable to listen to. <clears throat> so uh, I also, uh, you know, from listening to those and from reading your website, um, I gather that I, I got a sense of what your sort of spiritual history is, so to speak. You lived in India for nearly a decade, um, mostly in Amma's ashram and also in Tiruvannamalai. And you've also spent some time with, um, what's her name, uh, Pamela Wilson. Yeah. Whom I'll be interviewing a little you know, a couple months. And yes, I saw that. And Adya Shanti also, whom I'll also be interviewing. Um, yeah. And he came here in April to, to Fairfield, so that was wonderful. Yeah, that's an, another nice connection. Yeah. So let's fill in the gaps. Um, that's okay. A, that's a brief sketch, but where would you like to start? Okay. Wherever you want to start, I am... Well, like, like for instance, on your about page on your website, you you talk about how you know when you were a certain age, you you kind of got bitten by the spiritual bug, and then that set you off on this whole, you know, odyssey of of searching yeah. and doing things. So so let's start back there, but let's uh, fill it in a lot more. Okay, yeah, the spiritual bug um, bit me very suddenly, quite unexpectedly. I was uh, it was about twenty five years ago, and. Previously, I had led a life of... Uh, when you were five, right? Yeah, when I was five. Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm a little older than that. So I was living in, I was living in Tahoe City uh -huh. um, in lived California. lived in nice places. Yeah, I've lived in nice places. And uh, up until that point, I had lived a pretty wild life, um, did what I wanted to do with very little discipline. And one day, I was just done with that life. Uh -huh. I went down by the river. I lived right on the Truckee River, like I said, and sat down and closed my eyes. Um, I had no inclination before that moment to do that. Mm. And when that moment arrived, it, the timing was just right on. Um, something in me let go. And I knew that what I had previously thought of myself was no longer relevant. It was a, a moment of incredible grace and um, quite surprising. It surprised me. That life up to that point was completely over and a new life had begun. A new life of really, really devoting this life to knowing truth, to living truth, and to, um, I don't know, it, it was a level of surrender that I that just came from within. Um, had you written any? Had you read any books or anything about spiritual stuff, or is it totally an inner impulse that? You just it was a to It was a total in inside job. Mm. No, um, no books. Previous to that, I had interest in maybe the occult a little bit, um, tarot, astrology. When I was in high school, right? You know, I used to write. I used to do people's charts for Christmas presents. <laughs> 
like that. But other than that, there was nothing. There was ah. nothing at all. And this um, this impulse that came it came from it came from a longing. It came from an, a, a deep longing to 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 um, be connected, to know love. It was of the heart. Um, I really wanted to know. I wanted to break the veil. I wanted to see the other side. And it was a longing to know. It was. It came from my heart. It was. You know, they say that the true spiritual impulse comes from truth itself. Mm. That's where it comes from. It doesn't come from ego. Ego might come from behind that impulse. It might say, oh, this, I might get something out of this. But a real true impulse comes from true nature itself. It comes from something that is just, it's just time to, to know, to know yeah. it's. Um, so that would be what happened. Um, yeah, so that's, that was the moment. Yeah. I think a lot of us had those moments. It's, it's sort of like you, you I, know, you wonder what's going on. I, a lot of people I've interviewed too. It's like, were they blessed by an angel, or was it totally some kind of cosmic intelligence just bubbling up, or what? But there's just this sort of sudden turnaround, or sudden sort of knowing that okay, this this what I've been doing isn't working. Now I, I kn now I have a sense of what I need to do. You know? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think it's happened for a lot of people. Yeah. A lot, and uh, maybe a lot of people are a little frightened by it. Um, it catches them, you know, because it. It's it's asking for a, sh a shift. It's asking for a, a redirection of life, and maybe a lot of people even dismiss it mm -hmm. as something um, insubstantial or irrelevant, just yeah. sort of fluke thing. Huh. Um, In my case, there was nowhere to go but up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know. The tethers were cut, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, either either turn around and reverse direction or die. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You don't have a choice. It yeah. becomes a choice. It's a choiceless moment, and you're just you. It used to be your life. It's no longer your life anymore, yeah. Yeah. or the you that you used to be anyway. So what did you do then? What did I do then? Um, I um, pretty much broke off from all my friends. Mm -hmm. mm, my friends no longer supported that, which was. Um, living this, and I started to spend very long um, periods of time in the wilderness, mm. um, solo trips, up to eight to ten hours, uh, eight to ten days a mm. trip. Um, I just longed for the silence. I longed for no distraction, and it seemed to me that that deep connection that I was longing for was coming through in nature. Yeah. Um, the trees spoke to me. Forte was living in Lake Tahoe, and Desolation Wilderness was right outside my backyard, mm. basically, and um, which was in the in the 80s, 70s, and 80s was a wonderful, wonderful place to be. It was very quiet still, and uh, so I went there, and I would not, I wouldn't see a soul, and I'd go off trail just so I could be that isolated, and um, I just started to connect. To connect with the essence that is everywhere and always, um, and that essence, because I was so open to it, and all the protection was gone. You know, when you're in nature, you just drop it all. Um, that connection, the communication, was able to really um, establish itself. Nice. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that experience a little bit? I mean, I I, I have a sense of what you're saying, and I, I love to hike in nature and, and all yeah. myself, but um, is there anything more you can say about that? Well, <clears throat> when we st really stop and be present, mm -hmm. that presence can be felt in the space around us in the room, but it also can be experienced through objects, animate and inanimate, alive and seemingly mm, unalive. <laughs> yeah. Um, the trees and rocks, things of nature, have an especially strong transmission. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't really know the why of it, but it seems to me that they're almost there. Nature is almost there for us to, to connect to. Mm. It's It's... It's an aspect of the beloved that um, it's it's a gift, and it 
it's a very, very direct way, at least it was for me, to get to know presence. Um, and in doing so, because the protection was dropped here when I was out in nature for those long periods of time, um, the presence that was in the trees and the rocks and the mountains and the birds and the, and the bugs was also able to see the presence that was here in this, in, in this being. In you. In me, yeah. right. So it was being recognized on both, on both sides, hmm. which was exactly the same. It wasn't one recognizing another. It was one recognizing itself. It was presence recognizing itself. Hmm. In, both ex in all expressions. In all expressions, mm -hmm. and it became um, it it was extremely enjoyable mm -hmm. for me. You know, it was like all, all my years I was l actually wanting that and not knowing that, um, and to find it was very very satisfying. And I called this my spiritual honeymoon because uh -huh. ex that's exactly what it was. I was so high on you know, I mean, and and so deeply touched. I felt like. I had found the answer to happiness, which I had, but there was a lot more to come right. <laughs> that I didn't know at the time. But uh, this, this truth, this, this life, wanted to experience that honeymoon, that, that extremely joyful period of, of knowing itself hmm. um, before it started to settle into deeper places. Yeah. It's interesting because I mean I got th you you sort of implied that you had been doing drugs and stuff during your wilder days yes. and 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 you seem to have made quite a sudden shift you know to you know really being clear and and tuning into a deep level of nature in my case, it took me quite a while to kind of detox before I could really have the clarity to ap appreciate the kind of thing you've just been describing mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there was a detox of a different level after mm -hmm. the um, the the opening, the shift. Mm -hmm. I think part of my experience with drugs, um, that wild part part of my life, was really, um, you know, now that I look back, it was there was a drive within it that was, and I think a lot of people have this um, experience that wants to kind of break the veil. Yeah. You know, it wants to break through into something else. If I do more, maybe I'll break right. through. Yeah. If I get wilder and let go more. And it almost felt like there was almost uh, some protection in that, that I, there was never any damage done. There was almost an innocence to it. Mm -hmm. it, w it never caused any harm, never hurt anything or anyone. But for myself, there was a, th th it was a path. Yeah. And, you know, when you reach a culmination of that path, and it, you're just done with it. And I've seen that happen, and I have embarked upon several journeys uh, in this path um, that when it reach a reaches a culmination, it's just done. Yeah, you and, know it. And you just know it, exactly. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. interesting. Yeah, I kind of did the same thing, and I just knew it at a certain point. Dropped all my yeah. friends, spent my days yes. walking the dog down to the beach, and you know, that kind of thing. And all your friends wonder what's wrong with you, and <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, Ricky's just off on some new trip, you know, and and but you know that was it. Eventually, you know, that eventually you accumulate new friends who are more uh, yeah. in tune. <laughs> yeah, yeah, life yeah. brings life brings them to you. Yeah, yeah. so this. Um, you know, joy in the wilderness phase, did that too reach a point at which you thought, oops, that's done, now what? I don't know if it reached a culmination um, because it's still here. I yeah. still enjoy that very, very much. Mm -hmm. And um, But what happened first was because of the experience of being close with nature, mm -hmm. um, there arose a, a desire to kind of do ritual out there. Um, which is, you know, not something I really relate to anymore, but at that point really served me um, because what happened was a, um, a spontaneous prayer developed. And from the depths of my heart, I spoke to nature um, and brought it to a conscious level about what my intention was in this spiritual life I, I spoke to God to nature 
to presence from my heart Mm -hmm. and gave myself to that. Um, I think spontaneous prayer from the heart is one of the most powerful ways to get really, really clear about where you're at. And um, because this prayer started, um, this resonance with Native American old tradition um, started to develop here. I, I really loved the old tradition of Native Americans, how they prayed to the Great Spirit and to give thanks and to relate to the interconnectedness of all things and all beings in all relations, seeing them not as separate, but actually of the same. Um, there are some very, very high level Native American medicine people that um, knew this, experienced this, and was able to tap into a very, very powerful way of using and harnessing the power within nature to do incredible healings and to to draw the animals to them for food and sustenance, to work with the powers of the weather, all kinds of things. Um, so are, are you saying that you, a spontaneous prayer arose, a spontaneous kind of communion with God, and then you sought to find a more kind of, a little bit more of a structured channel for that, and so you turned to Native American spirituality in order to um, give, an, give an expression to that spontaneous prayer? Yeah, I was doing ritual by myself, and um, just I, making it up, kind of. Uh, yeah, making it up. It just yeah. came from within. I just seemed to know how to do it. Uh-huh. Um, there's definitely some strong past life there. Um, yeah. And I and I was doing some travelings at that point. I was ending up going to the southwest and going into the ancient sites and doing ritual there, mm-hmm. um, because there's definitely a lot of old presence in there. Um, right. Going in, going into the kivas, and I was on a trip in Arizona Mm -hmm. Um, somebody crashed into the side of my truck (laughs) and I had to put it into the shop and I was going to be stuck in Sedona for three weeks which was not a bad place to be stuck in the 1980s Um, it was there that I met my first formal formal teacher a Native American medicine man from the Lakota Sioux tribe Um, it was I don't want to get too into it, but it was a very, very powerful healing experience for about two years. Mm-hmm. Um, it shook my world. It started mm-hmm. that detox. Yeah. Uh, yeah and um, there was some sort of clearing that needed to be done, some sort of uh, healing um, mm-hmm. that needed to happen with this, um, this specific way and this specific person. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, once again, I went through that journey, and when it was done, when it was resolved or finished, it was, it was over. Can you give us just a couple of highlights from that before we move on? You know, what sort of healing, what, how your world was shaken, you know, what sort of, <laughs> what sort of changes you went through as, yeah. during those two years? Yeah, you want, the, you want the grit, okay. Just a little bit. <laughs> it was, uh, it, it's kind of a story. Mm-hmm. Um, when I got to Sedona, right after I put the truck in the shop, I met some people and I was sort of staying with them. And I didn't, I hadn't met really anybody, but I was driving down the road and all of a sudden this intense um, stress and, and grief and overwhelming emotion started to come up. Until that point, I had not experienced anything so so terrifying Hmm. Um, I went back to the house where I was staying in and I kind of went into this room and shut the door and there was no furniture in the room it was empty and this terror came up and this overwhelming grief was actually the, the underlying emotion just waves and waves and waves of it started to come in and um, it I just sort of let go to it and it opened a, a doorway and I had what's called a, a total past life recall where I actually 
relived a moment in a past life. And it was a Native American moment. And um, it was one where I had lost pretty much all my loved ones and was experiencing tremendous grief. And this person that I had met later was part of that experience, although I hadn't met him yet. I'm getting kind of ahead of myself here. The person that I had rented the room from happened to be this kind of psychic person, which I was never really too into before. And she told me that somebody was coming to Sedona to help me with this process. And um, lo and behold, about three days later, I went into this Uipi ceremony, which is a very, very um, sacred ceremony of the Lakota Sioux tribe where they call in the ancient spirits. And this man, I'm not going to use his name right now, but it, he was the facilitator, the, the medicine man of this ceremony. And uh, he led it, and it was a tremendous experience. There was a lot of healing. And then I went away not thinking anything of it. And a couple of days later, I get this phone call from this medicine man, and he's inviting me to his house to have dinner with his family. And this was the medicine man who was part of that past life who had appeared to help me with resolve that um, that specific past life. It goes even deeper and more terrifying than that. And I, I don't really want to get into it too much. That's okay. Um, I won't, I won't yeah. force you to. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. But yeah. it was it was so spontaneous and it was so full of grace. And it was so powerful. I couldn't have ever planned on doing it myself. It just happened. Yeah, that to me is one of the, the biggest things that jumps out from it is the, the sort of the way these things are orchestrated. You yeah. know? I yeah. mean, your, your truck getting hit was no accident. And no. you know, no. meeting these people and going to this place and all that stuff. And it always fascinates me when I hear those kinds of things because you, it makes you wonder about the intelligence that's, that's the puppeteer and all these Right. Sorts of events right. in our lives, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, that part of my life, I look back and, it, you know, it's kind of the things that I experienced were things you would read about in books. I mean, I, I got to see the ancient beings come into the room and take up sacred objects and fly through the room. I got to see mm. the medicine man put fire in his mouth and, and, and sing these songs. Um Carlos Castaneda. Car kind of stuff. Yes, exactly. I yeah. mean, it was very, very, very powerful. Um, and to experience that, I'm very, very grateful. But I could see that it was something that was coming from the truth itself. Mm -hmm. it, it had its own wisdom. Yeah. And uh, it, it's to trust that and to keep seeing it happening is, is, is really the source of faith, I think. Um, yeah, in other words, it was such far out stuff that it took a certain amount of faith to even hang in there and keep, <laughs> keep doing it, right? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. tough. It was tough. Yeah. Native American peoples really don't like what young white women hanging around. Either. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> not huh. too, not too much. The the medicine man didn't have a problem with it, but the rest of them they they yeah. didn't like it too much. <laughs> well, they must get a lot of wannabes, you know, who yeah. sort of yeah. come around and want to do the thing, but you know, they're not really yeah. in, in that culture. Right. Yeah. All right. So after a couple of years of that, you reached <laughs> another another kind of uh, transition point. Yeah. Um, the interest um, then took a radical turn to more of the Eastern mm -hmm. philosophies of really wanting to know um, what the enlightened ones said. <laughs> I wanted to know really what where it was coming from and I really wanted to hear it from masters that knew the truth mm -hmm. in, a, in a language that maybe I could understand um, like Molly Allen yeah Molly <laughs> 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 what <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't until a couple of years after that that I met Amma and actually okay. the, my first um, about that time right um, during the Native American, after the Native American experience, I started to get very ill. I had a, um, a very, very strong, healthy 
um, vibrant image of myself that needed to get broken down, I guess, uh. due to the fact of that, that spiritual honeymoon that I was given and spending all that time outside. I was very vibrant and healthy and in shape. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that didn't last very long. I um, got sick. I got very, very ill um, to the point of I had to spend many, many months in bed. Hmm. Um, and as soon as I get better, and I've heard this happening to another, other people, uh, I'd get up and try to be healthy again and try to go out backpacking and that kind of thing. And I just, I, I was so weak. And um, it got to the point where my body didn't want to take in hardly any kinds of food. It was, it got, um, the ability to ingest food became very, very simple, um, very, very small amounts. And <clears throat> I went Similar to thing happened to Adyashanti. He kept trying yeah. to go out and bicycle race and he kept yeah. getting knocked, knocked back into bed again. Down. Yeah, and it was very, very difficult when you have a very strong image of yourself as being, being very healthy. Yeah. The, phys the physicalness um, and uh, I you know I went to doctor and doctors spent lots of money and just mm -hmm. trying to fix myself and that that trying to fix myself wasn't gonna happen mm -hmm. something was getting broken down no matter what I did wasn't it wasn't gonna work and so what it did is it elicited a level of surrender that's all that could happen mm -hmm. that surrender um, when there's true spontaneous surrender happening it has a very, very powerful way of opening up the heart. Mm -hmm. And because that prayer was already um, here, it opened up the heart more, and that's all I could do was let go and pray. Um, and it, something started to be born within that, which was a true longing, a true longing for the beloved. Huh. I wanted that. Because nothing else was going to work, <laughs> I could see that. the The wisdom within knew that. Mm -hmm. And um, so, when you when you're pretty incapacitated, you know, I would go from the bathtub to the bed, and maybe to the floor. <laughs> um, the, there's not a whole lot more to do. I mean, you can't. All you there, all there is left to do is to let go. So I think that that was really when this, um, de the devotional, more the devotional aspect of my experience really was born. Mm. Um, different beings, I started to connect with Paramahansa Yogananda. At that time, I was um, initiated into, into Kriya mm -hmm. Yoga from one of his direct disciples. Um, but I don't know how long that lasted, that Kriya Yoga, it didn't really seemed like a very, very strong way for me. Um, the, the devotional aspect was, was stronger. It was a little more real. It was a little more closer to the bone for me. Mm. Um, it was at that point where the feminine aspect, the, the mother, started to kind of come into my awareness. And while I laid there, helpless as a baby, weak as a baby, I could feel her holding me, hmm. comforting me. Uh, the divine feminine. Yes. Not yes. any particular human manifestation of it, but just the divine feminine. Well, the first one that I really, that I connected with, because it was the only one I knew was Mother Mary, uh, okay. because she was just the only one I really knew of. I didn't right. know of any others. Mm -hmm. But she became more than that embodiment or that incarnation. She became mother, just mother the feminine, just being held by mother. My mother had passed away um, just about the time when I had that first shift, um, when I was 28 years old. And so it was, and I, I, my father had left a number of years before that, and so this parent, this divine parent, was a, was a, a comfort. And it was very useful um, to connect with that, to let go, to, um, in a way, into, into something else. <clears throat> and uh, this, I think this was the beginning of really opening up to the divine in the mother. Mm -hmm. um, 
that lasted for a few years. <clears throat> Were you sick all that time, or did your it was your health coming back? It was coming in and out. It was it would kind of do that thing of I'd be sick for a few months, and then I'd try to get better, and I'd get sick, and then I could just mm. get better. Um, it was gradually getting less because something that image was getting whittled away. It was yeah. it was definitely getting reduced, mm -hmm. um, and this open heartedness was becoming more the prominent experience it's really i mean it was taking it was taking over yeah. i didn't know it at the time but that's what was happening um and to kind of take a few shortcuts there was a number of other teachers that i started to read about and to connect with eastern teachers um women not so much, actually. Uh, Yogananda was one, just because he was a, he was actually another incarnation of the Divine Mother. He really connected with Mother. Mm -hmm. um, um, Ramakrishna Paramahansa, also mm -hmm. another, you know, beloved right. of the Mother. Right. Um, but also at the same time, I was reading. <clears throat> you know, I started to pick up you know, the Vedas and the Upanishads and the scriptures that mm -hmm. Atma Bodha that talked about the truth of the of of the essence, what the Eastern philosophies call the self. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so that was starting to fill in the spaces that were being opened up. And uh, then my my beloved dog died which was like my only family. You, you're a dog person. You know yeah. what they're like, their children. Mm -hmm. I'm now got, one, got one sitting under my desk right, right here. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, that left a big hole in my life. Mm. Oh, and there was a time also, I, for, I should mention this. This was a very important time in my life. At that time when I was still sick, I was working with a group called Clear Light, and they were in Sedona. Oh, by the way, I ended up staying in Sedona. Uh -huh. I stayed there. I didn't. Oh, you, you moved yeah. there. Then. Yeah. I moved. I I just stayed there. Right. Um. And uh, I was working in a with a group called Clear Light, and we would meet, and they were all old, older. I shouldn't say old for all those people that are listening to this. Our age. <laughs> all our older than me at, at thirty right. years old. I was yeah. thirty years old. Um, they some of them were direct disciples of Paramahansa. Um, very very. Um, experienced people on the path and they had developed this um, emotional um, uh, releasing technique called clear light we would meet three times a week for three hours a session and they would use kinesiology to unlock these unconscious stories it was very very powerful is that muscle testing is that, is that exactly you, it was yeah, muscle okay. testing and they would use this muscle testing to to get into stories that we have locked in about ourselves and about life and it would just trigger emotional release and so I, at that point I got really a com a comfortable with emotion it was very because um, I would lay on the floor for hours going through this wow. emotional release um, technique and uh, it was very very <clears throat> very gritty for me gritty time mm. uh, because you know nobody else is laying on the floor for hours. <laughs> <laughs> Always the extremist, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that went on for about two years, and um, mm. and I guess another culmination happened there. Um, so the just out of curiosity, this is a mundane question, but how yeah. do you support yourself during all this? Just sort of doing little odd jobs. And oh yeah, I was waiting a, tables or whatever. And yes, yeah, yes, I that was, kind of stuff. Yeah. I did yeah. whatever I could. I worked Just in bookstores. Along. Yeah, waited tables. Mm -hmm. I've I've done everything. You know, landscaping, mm -hmm. gardening, delivering phone books, mm -hmm. taking care of Alzheimer's, working in kitchens. Yeah. Um, I've I've never really had a skill. I've never mm -hmm. had a career. I've just done whatever came my way and opened up, and um, that's been fine. Mm -hmm. um, I've never felt the need to be somebody. Um, it was just whatever, just to keep life going, kind yeah. of a thing. Yeah, right. Basic stuff. Yeah, basic stuff. Okay. Um, so, so anyway, you were in Sedona. You did the emotional, the clearing thing, the kin kinesiology. 
Yeah, and then the dog died. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had my friends. I had heard people talk about Ama, um, Amachi, mm-hmm. and uh, what a wonderful being of light she was, and and knowing that she was an embodiment of Mother, you know, it it piqued my interest. But I wasn't looking for a teacher right. um, because I had this heart connection with the Mother that was so real and so intimate, and had been there through all this processing through all this unfoldment and through all this loss um, I couldn't imagine meeting the mother in the form I don't there was a part of me that didn't think I could survive it my love for the mother was so huh. huge you mean you were afraid that if you met an embodiment of it that it would be like blow your circuits it would yeah exactly <laughs> Okay. I was if I I didn't think I could handle it. So you kind of acknowledged that she was an embodiment of it, but you so you were like trepidatious about actually meeting her fate in the in the flesh. Well, and it was almost as if I didn't believe she was an embodiment. I didn't believe she was the mother. Okay. There was a part of me because I thought I knew the mother. Right. Through my heart. And how and could that, any how could I, any embodied being really em, you know embody that? Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And um. So anyway, my, my dog died. There was a big hole in my life, and I thought I would go and visit my grandmother who lived in California. <clears throat> and um, I saw on a flyer that Amma was going to be in California right when I was going to be there, and her center was very, very close to where my grandmother lived, coincidentally. In San Ramon. San Ramon, yeah. My grandmother lived in San Rafael. Oh, yeah. And um, so I was taking a trip, going to see my grandma and this this teacher from India, this saint mm-hmm. that I had at that time had no connection with. But I was really longing for some spiritual nourishment. I was, I, I was needing to be in the presence. And um, What year are we at now? 1993. Okay, good. And uh, so I... I arrived at San Ramon. Nobody was there. There was maybe three cars in the parking lot, and mm-hmm. and it was in between the the evening and the morning program. Uh-huh. And one of the brahmacharis was there from India, and he's Sri Swami now. He's in orange now, but back then he was in yellow. And he was opening a gate, and he turned to me, and he gave me the most beatific smile. You mm-hmm. know, just warm welcome. Mm-hmm. And Is that I. Amrita? No, it was Sri Swami. He's a little guy that big beard and he smiles a lot. The, the plays the flute, that guy. Yes, yes. Okay, that yeah, guy, he's cool. That guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's, he's beautiful. He's, he's a, beaming. Yeah, yeah blissful he's just dude. Beaming. Yeah. So I drove in, just going. Oh, I'm you know so thankful to be there in that mm-hmm. moment, and um, I met some people in the parking lot and a couple, uh, one woman, and she brought me in and sat me down. And um, some more people came in. And Alma came in. And there's the chanting. And with Alma comes a fragrance. And I'm sure you've experienced this yourself. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily a, 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 a smell fragrance, an olfactory, but it's a, a sensing fragrance, mm. a sweetness. And she walks in and and that fragrance was something that I recognized from my heart connection with mother. Mm. And it, it stopped me short. You know, I, I, it was unexpected. And she, and she walked in and she sat down and, you know, and just beaming at everybody. And I was right up front. And she never really looked at me. <laughs> and she started to give darshan, and she's giving these incredibly long darshans to everybody back then. Yeah. <laughs> and just playing with them, almost, you know, cuddling with them and playing with them and really engaging. And so my turn came to go have darshan. And, uh, she gave me a really short one. <laughs> <laughs> really short. Didn't look at me. 
and I just kind of got up and walked away and went back to my seat and you know and mine said well it's my ego she's reducing my ego you know that kind of thing and there was a number of days there and every single time I'd go for my darshan she'd give me these really short darshans hmm. never looked in my direction um, but yet there was something going on there was you know, there was definitely something going on and I found myself trying to talk myself out of wanting more. <laughs> you know, have yeah. you ever experienced that? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the, the programs at <clears throat> San Ramon were over and she left and she's on the way to Santa Fe and I decide to follow her <laughs> to Santa Fe. And um, she comes walking into the hall and she walks up to me. I'm sitting there, and she puts her hand on my head, and she pushes down really hard. Hmm. And she goes up and sits down. With her palm or with like a finger? Her whole hand. Her whole hand. Just on the, cr on the okay. crown of my head, just pushed right. down. Mm -hmm. Didn't look at me or anything. All of a sudden, I just felt like my whole universe just cracked. Mm. And all that trying not to, to want something more <laughs> broke free. And all the longing that was in my heart for the beloved, for God, for truth, for mother, for union, for everything, just came to the surface like a tsunami. Hmm. And um, it was such an upheaval. I had to leave the hall, and I went out into the woods and just sat myself down in the trees and gave into that hmm. and um, stayed out there for quite a while. And I came back in for the next program with her, and I went to get my darshan. And she held me for a very, very long time. Mm. And I, I knew that, you know, she had just kind of claimed me <laughs> as something had happened. Yeah. Um, she, then she left. She was only in Santa Fe for a short time. And I went up into the Pecos Wilderness up in the hills above Santa Fe and did a, an overnight up there. And I just sat up there in the hills and I knew I was going to sell my little Toyota truck and go to India. I, I just knew it. There was no question about it. That's pretty much all the assets I had. Hmm. So I sold my truck and I went to India the following um, fall. So Incidentally, let's just interject here for a second. For those not familiar with Amma, the reason she's called the Hugging Saint, uh, and you can find out more about her if you go to amma.org, but um, is that her way of giving darshan is to literally physically hug people. And um, when I first heard about that, it seemed sort of touchy-feely to me. It seemed sort of, you know, isn't that cute? She hugs people. But, but there's nothing superficial about it. Um, no. it it's, it's, a profound, it's a method or a way of profound spiritual transmission and you know really sort of deeply connecting with a person um, that's just what she does so that's what joy has been referring to here yeah yeah um, <coughs> so you want me to continue yeah to yeah go ahead I just, to, yeah. I just wanted to say that in case I mean you and I are familiar with Lama so we're taking this for granted but some people may never have you really figured out or heard much about her, and so they might not know quite what you're referring to. Yeah. Okay, and but please continue. Yeah. Yeah, and just to elaborate on that, you know, the darshan. Very few masters have ever really given darshan through a touch. Yeah, usually, usually they're very standoffish, or maybe yeah. they'll hit, hit you with a peacock feather or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. or a stick, or or just the gaze, yeah. or just being in presence. Mm -hmm. Um. And some of them are very uh, uh, averse to being touched. You know. Yes. At all. And I think Amma's way of embracing allows us to let go, um, allows us to open up. Um, because a lot of people, even sitting in satsang, to, to get somebody to open up, it's, it's not an easy process. And this embrace is something that every human being, it, we're, we're just wired to, to touch. Yeah. Um, it's, it's something that allows us to feel supported. And when we feel supported, we can let go. Um, and yeah. and I th it's a very effective way of opening up people. 
Yeah, I've seen big, tough football player types, you know, go up and just come <laughs> back, come out of it sobbing like a baby. And oh, yes, I know, <laughs> I know. The, the, the policemen, they go up and all, yeah, mm -hmm. I've seen all kinds go up to see them. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the years of India were, were uh, I just call it my period of, of, of intense deconditioning. Um, Amma, when I first went to her, there was very little translation. It was all in Malayalam, and right. you didn't understand anything she was talking about. So the options of really um, connecting with Amma were either to try to get as close to her as possible or really be present with her. What's the difference? You mean be present? whatever you were doing, even if you're off working in the kitchen, just have your attention on her, is that what you're saying? Yeah, or um, or be receptive, mm -hmm. open. Um, you know, there's the opposite of, of trying to grasp her, physically close to her, which uh, many people do, or they're, which is a wonderful experience as well. But to be able to receive that incredible transmission that Alma is always sharing, um, that I found to be for myself um, the most effective. Mm -hmm. um, there is a the the transmission of Alma is a silent one, but it's an inside. It comes from the inside. We think it comes from her, but it's actually coming from within our own heart. It's it's activating that. Uh -huh. uh, they all, you know, it's often said that the highest teaching is the silent teaching. Mm -hmm. And to learn how to receive that is, is really the invitation all the time for us. No matter if we're in the presence of Amma or the trees or our, just ourselves sitting in the room, being open and receptive to what this moment is, is, is offering us. Um, so that was, I, I did that all the time. I sat in Amma's presence and just absorbed as much as I could. Uh, I wasn't a Saveite. I'm not wired that way. Um, there are... Translate that. Okay. Saveites, um, there's a lot of selfless service around Amma's ashram. Mm -hmm. Amma, she says most people aren't able to sit for eight to ten hours a day in contemplation. Most people need activity, um, and oftentimes, even when we're when we're going through a lot of um, deconditioning, I call it. It's helpful to just go um, participate or do engage in some activity, mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of work to be done. And we all had our own little jobs. I had lots of little jobs. I never did lots of work. Um, I did, you know, I chopped vegetables and cleaned toilets and watered the the, the plants in the yard. Um, you know, I, I did a lot of little jobs, but um, for the most part, I was uh, more of a contemplative. So I would either sit in Amma's presence or I'd sit on the roof and look out onto the ocean, which the ashram is right on the Arabian Sea. You could hear the crash of the waves, and, which is very, very nice. Um, so this period in India that I call a deconditioning, if I could describe it, it's not an easy place to be. Amma's ashram back then, it was um, <clears throat> quite, aus what's the word I'm looking for? Austere. Austere, thank you. Yeah. Um, it, we were very many to a room. Mm -hmm. The food was very simple. Um, it was very, very spicy. Very <laughs> spicy. <laughs> and uh, not to mention the climate was very hot and very wet. And I'm used to more of a cool, dry climate. Um, you had to wear all these clothes if you're a woman. Yeah. <laughs> and um, back then, we, it was very strict, too. There was also a lot more rules involved. Um, but it kind of suited me, the discipline. I'd get up at four in the morning and go into the hall and, and do the morning chants and meditation. And I, I like that structure mm -hmm. of a lifestyle. It suited me. But for the most part, it was very 
hard because I was used to having a lot of my own space, um, not being so crowded. I was always, <laughs> my roommates were always people that I wouldn't have chosen to be my roommates. <laughs> um, that was very, very difficult for me. Mm -hmm. um, and mo for most of the time there, the energy was, uh, there's a lot of Shakti. Yeah. And it's, I don't know if you've ever experienced it around Alma, especially like the Devi Bhava when you're, or just trying to rest and you've had two hours of sleep and you know you need to sleep, but you can't. Right. You're laying there and all under your skin is a vibration going on. That that went on for about seven years for me. I, I can't cry out, but my wife is always, she she can never sleep when she goes to Alma. She does things. that, yeah. 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 <laughs> so that was going on for me, and um, I would, but I would come back every summer and work here in the West. Um, Make some money, renew your visa. Exactly. Um, that wasn't an easy process either, because when I would come back, I had no place to go. Mm. So oftentimes I found myself sleeping in storage lockers and on ba in basements and huh. in tents and wow yeah I was driven I was yeah. I was obsessed I, there was something in me that was quite insane going on huh. um, during yeah. all this time did, were you ever sort of uh, attracted to get into a romantic relationship with anybody or was that like forget it I'm I'm on the fast track that's a good question there was mm -hmm. um, there wasn't room for that. There just mm -hmm. wasn't space. There was, uh, there was some other process going on, and there just was no invitation at all. Um, it, and it's, it was interesting to me because it wasn't like I was, I thought there wasn't an idea that it shouldn't be. Yeah. I, did, I didn't embrace the celibacy of, of a renunciate. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I wasn't a renunciate. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even one of those formal renunciates that that do that over there. Right. I was um, I was actually termed a visitor mm -hmm. um, because I wasn't a resident or anything because I would come and go. But when I was here, no, there was just no room for anything but what yep. was needed at the moment. Yeah. Pedal to the metal. Pedal to the metal. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, so you were you you this went on for ten years, and you're going back and forth. Um, yeah, it was about seven years, and then a shift happened. Okay. Um, and you know, before that, I had done all those North India tours. I did. I think I did five of them. Oh, those are brutal. I understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Going on twenty-four hour bus rides and you know huge mobs and what. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, but also the blissful moments of swimming every day with Alma right. and, and singing and little and roadside snacks and things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a lot. I had a lot. My favorite memories were during those moments, mm -hmm. those breaks. Um, but there was um, a shift after about seven years, and you know, I I didn't know what was going on, Rick. I had no concept of what was happening. Hmm. All I knew was that I was being driven. And, you know, I would meditate a lot. I was a, me I was a meditator, and um, I would sit, and I would have these extraordinary, extraordinary experiences. Would you do uh, a technique that Ama had taught you, or your Kriya Yoga technique, or something that just came naturally, spun whatever, you just kind of yeah. made up your own thing? It was something that I was always kind of, I think, uh, had been... Just natural. It, it was medicine. natural. Yeah. Yeah. It was something I'd already, I'd already known. Right. right? And um, it was very easy for, for me to just sort of let go into okay. this absorption. And you um, say you had some extraordinary experiences with that? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like for instance? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, total oneness, total... I mean, mm. a lot of times I would actually become the Divine Mother. Huh. My my body, I would hold mudras, and the body would shake. A lot of shakti would mm. be going on. Um, this this happened from pretty much the first year in India, and uh, but there was a part of me that knew that the experiences were irrelevant. They were inspiring, 
they were incredibly inspiring because they were full, so full of light. And when I was meditating, there was no more meditator. There was nobody doing anything. There was nobody having an experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so you might want to call them actually in themselves little subtle shifts of perception um, because I could see that what was the small me didn't really have a place in the perception of what was uh, the perception of awareness. Yeah. In other words, you sort of saw the ephemeral or insubstantial nature of the small me because the the big me became so substantial that by contrast the small me was you know nothing much to it yeah yeah there wasn't much to it right that's that small me didn't really have a place in this whole path it didn't it it was hanging on for dear life it was yeah and it wasn't (laughs) it it i I, there would be a little bit of concern, but for the most part, it was really, um, it wasn't given much attention to. Yeah. And um, I don't know how that came about. I really don't. There wasn't any directive coming from Mama. There wasn't, I didn't have that satsangi kind of look at the small me. It doesn't really exist. Mm-hmm. But there was, a, a, there was an experience of it. And um, so this deconditioning that was happening was a deconditioning of, self was the per of the personal self of what it wanted and what it needed and what it thought it what life should be yeah and it really sounds very automatic in your case it really sounds like you were basically being done you know you you weren't doing and you weren't saying okay now here's the next step you were just sort of like holding on and i mean not holding on but just sort of like being driven along through this process it, and it was coming from entirely from the inside. I had no idea what was going on. Yeah. Not none. Huh. I was I was clueless. It's, it's I was just like trying to survive. Divine intelligence <laughs> was just molding you somehow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Amma always kind of describes, you know, what the master does is she's like the master jeweler. Jeweler. She sees in the disciple or the student the perfect jewel, the mm-hmm. potential, and she cuts. With, cuts away all the other with, stuff with precision yeah. of, of a master jeweler with absolute mm-hmm. precision she wants the ultimate brilliance right you know and she <laughs> some of the things that i would see happen around me it was like oh huh. it would be so bizarre but so effective so mm. ruthless but so effective like what oh <laughs> i always like for instances you know like examples <laughs> I, I I can't really think of anything okay, right doesn't now. Matter. I mean, maybe they, something will come I'll to sh- mind. I'll share some more with you. I'll think of some later. Okay, but you know, later. actually, it's it's interesting to note here that just as you were being done, sort of. I mean, it's not like you like some individuality was driving this process. You were just kind of you know, rushing down the rapids, um, <laughs> you know. Uh, but then you were saying, oh, but what the master does. But then you know, the question arises: Well, what what the master is. You know, because what is Amma? She's not not just this lady that you know was born there in Kerala and is doing her thing in her ashram. You know, she she's sort of that that divine intelligence. Also, the same thing that's driving you from within is yes. driving her. But you yeah. know, maybe she's a bit a more powerful engine or something like you know, same electricity power is a little light here and a really bright spotlight there. Yeah. But it's the same electricity. Uh, but somehow, if you get in the field of that bright spotlight you know it's it's much more sort of intense right right that's it yeah. there's a there's the thousand watt light bulbs and then there's the little tiny yeah flash, the flashlights and or actually there's the little tiny flashlights and there's the lightning bolts yeah right light um, there's one though the lamps be many according to the line from the incredible string band oh yeah yeah, yeah. that's and that's what it is we're just lights many lights yeah the same but I think that the, the interesting point to note here is that if you're in a place like that, um, there's a sort of a, the, f- the, the field, as it were, is so saturated, um, so intense, that this sort of evolutionary tendency that you've been describing as having g- guided your life from your early 20s is ramped up, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's uh, you know, all the, you know, your circuitry is just flooded more and more and more with with that divine energy, which affects 
much deeper and more profound changes more readily more rapidly mm-hmm. would you agree with all that yes yes yeah. and 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 not to, and and not to be able to understand it allowed it it wasn't like i was trying to fit into any kind of concept mm-hmm. you know because love and and surrender allows you to let go to the degree that it cannot be fit into any box it's going to be a it's going to be a free for all whatever the de- whatever the intelligence deems appropriate yeah deems necessary thy will be done thy will be done <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly and that is that is the beautiful um that's the gift of of devotion i think is thy will be done and and it's such a you know i have a very very deep respect for both the non-dual advaita perspective and the and the devotional because they're actually the same there's yeah. not a difference and i mean my perspective changes continuously throughout the day of the two mm-hmm. and but the devotional aspect allows us to really keep letting go to the degree that it's being invited it's being asked Somebody gave me a quote just yesterday from Mama. Uh, he said, he, he, I think she said this recently. She said, the biggest lesson we should learn from spirituality is how to love and serve others as we would ourselves. This is real Advaita. Yeah, yes. Because we don't see a difference, do we? Right. We don't see a difference. And, you know, and that shift that happened after the seven years was, okay, what am I? What really am I? Mm-hmm. Why did that spontaneous questioning arise because it was just time huh. it was time to connect the two and to really see that oh this wanted to be revealed it was just it was just a time hmm. and so uh, prior to that seven year point that question hadn't been really arising you just been going along but then somehow that became it came to the fore yeah, it came to the fore. There was still that interest in the non-dual perspective. I was still, I, you know, my books, when I would read them, would kind of go between, um, I, I love the Atmabodha, which is knowledge of self. It's a little tiny book about this big. Um, and I would read that a lot. And these, I would just read little passages each evening and, and, and dwell on that. But there hadn't been a real direct natural inquiry in, up until that point. Hmm. And once again, a spontaneous invitation arose. I was in a, um, a little guest house in Chennai after landing in India. Um, Amma was somewhere else in Europe or something. And I met this couple who were Amma devotees, and they had been spending a lot of time in Tirvan Amalai and at Ramana's ashram. Ramana Maharshi's ashram, and they invited me to come along. They had a tax. They had a taxi, paid for, and I thought that would be wonderful. I wasn't in. I wasn't. I was cooked. I I just didn't want to go to Amma's ashram without her there, and I just was. I I was ready for something else. Mm-hmm. And when I arrived at Ramana's ashram, I didn't have a reservation to stay at the ashram, which is a very small place. Um, but they let me stay there, um, but, and immediately there was a very deep, deep connection with the energy of Ramana and the mountain and the people that were there. I felt like I, I, there was a, another place that felt very familiar to me, um, and they, I could see that well, I spent a lot of time in the meditative med- meditation hall, and um, I could feel them almost like looking out for me there because once again, all the experiences started happening. Um, they pretty much would happen whenever I close my eyes, but I would sit in that hall for hours in this place of no meditator, no no one, um, and receiving this incredible grace of Brahmana, Bhagwan. Um, when Amma came back, I was just reading a book about him last night. <laughs> oh, good. When Amma came back, I went to her and I asked her if I should stay there, and mm-hmm. she told me, "Yes, you go there." 
and um, this is a very rare thing for Alma to give her blessing to do that. She didn't. Right. You, she told most people, everything is here. You don't need to go anywhere. But she told me to go. Mm -hmm. um, and I had uh, experienced some, I, there was a readiness to know self. And, you know, without a physical form of Ramana there, there's pictures everywhere. And there's the samadhi there, which they do the pujas on, and people walk around. And there's the hill. But it's very much the transmission of the formless, mm -hmm. of inquiry. Mm. The inquiry of Ramana didn't work for me right well, right away. It, the what am I or, or who am I was his. It didn't um, really work for me in those words. It actually had to. It actually came from a different place at first. It was more of a sensing presence within my own being. And just putting my attention there. Mm -hmm. um, I think this "what am I, who am I" thing can, is often taken very superficially. Anyway, you know, it's not, it's not like you're supposed to just repeat those words. It's a much deeper thing than that. Yes, yes. Yeah. And a, and a lot of people use inquiry to get. It's almost as if I what I see is they'll use those questions to get out of their experience. Mm. You know, who is it that's experiencing this in a moment of? Um, identification or, or a moment of, of uncomfortability, let's say, even more so, uncomfortability. Uh -huh. A lot of people use the inquiry to, to help them. To into, kind of escape? Yeah, to move back into a more of a comfortable place, maybe a place of expansiveness or presence. Detached. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this, um, this spontaneous awareness of presence, of being, um, really wanted to be experienced in a place that didn't have any distraction of form. Hmm. I wanted to really be known. Uh, and that's, so I spent two years at Ramana's, and that was wonderful. Hmm. And then Alma called me back. And Not I stop, or do you have like visa problems and you have to keep going home? And I back? did, I went home, I went home once. You know, and yeah. when I would come back, it would just be for a few desperate months of working. Yeah, yeah. Shifts and, and then, then back to India. Back. Okay, so you spent a couple of years there, and then Amma called you just out of the blue, or were you sort of going over to, to uh, Amma's ashram now and then and and touching base, or, or you know, had she, were you completely out of sight, out of mind for two years? No, I would go back um, periodically, but there were times when she would be in India at her ashram, and I'd be in Tiruvannamalai, mm -hmm. and the mind was having trouble with that. It was kind of going, "Your master's over there." Yeah, what are you doing here? <laughs> and you're here. Why? Yeah. But there was something in that wasn't moving over there. <clears throat> it wasn't going there. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I struggled with that a little bit. And then um, I went to see her in the Chennai. She has an ashram in Chennai, and I went to see her there, and um, which was only a few hours away from Ramana's. And I just knew. And, I, and, I, and the thought came in, oh, Amma wants me to come back. And she looked at me with a beautiful smile. You know, mm. she does that. As soon as you yeah. know something, she'll look at you and smile and affirm it. Yeah. And uh, it's, and I went back, and that last year, it was my last year with Amma. Um, it was wonderful mm. because I was with her in a place of, but also having my own sense of presence, mm -hmm. but also being with Amma. Yeah. I knew something was coming to a close, but also I knew that, that, that my time in India was coming to an end. I knew it. Um, and it made me sad because it, I didn't know how else, what else, I didn't know what else to do after that. But that last year I went um, on a North India tour, on the, would look at me constantly, constantly mm -hmm. for for about nine months. And I heard you say that there was a time when she didn't look at you for two years. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. <laughs> there was, yeah, I didn't yeah. mention that. There was yeah, there earlier was, on. Yeah, there was a period when she didn't look at me for two years. Mm -hmm. That was tough, when I wanted her to look at me desperately. Right. Um, she didn't give me so, much of anything. So for nine months she'd looked at you constantly. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I I knew that I was. What did, you, what did you make of that? I mean, what was going on there? It was a. Uh, almost like a, a, a sense of she was giving me myself. Hmm. It was, um, there was 
and it was a sense that all that longing it was very different i it, i couldn't conjure it up it wasn't there you didn't have longing at this I point i didn't have longing yeah. at this point Felt there was it, kind of full yeah it was yeah. a it was a completely different experience i was coming from myself mm -hmm. i was coming from myself there was there was a sense of fullness more um, yeah Incidentally, I just want to say that you know people who haven't actually lived with a master or been with a master might find this talk of oh she looked at me she didn't look at me all that kind of stuff they might find that kind of funny it's like what's the big yes. deal you know yes. uh, but it means something for someone who is in a master disciple relationship it has significance and and it's 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 not like a a superficial high school kind of oh she looked at me she didn't look at me kind right. of thing that there's some there's some powerful stuff going on. Yeah, and you know, and I would invite that those people that would question that mm -hmm. to imagine themselves sitting with their teachers in satsang. Yeah, and not being looked at for two years, or never having been being called when you try to ask a question. Or oh, right, <laughs> or or maybe dismissed, or maybe having their question dismissed. Yeah, yeah. or 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 you know, or kind of shunned, you know, pushed aside um, to see how that would feel to them. Yeah. Because something in you is going to get shook up, mm -hmm. right? Something in you is going to say, "Well, why aren't they looking at me? They're not giving me the respect and the, and the, you know, the, that kind of recognition that I deserve, that I should have." Who said? And this brings up a lot, you know, this not being looked at, not being even. I mean, sometimes not even a glimmer of a glance. Right. And meanwhile, you're just in your own deconditioning, your own process, and nowhere else to go. Mm. No nice little satsangi place. <laughs> All right? Yeah. And you can't escape that. You're encountering yourself to the fullest degree. And that's what a master does. Mm -hmm. She gives you the, um, or he, gives you the opportunity to encounter encounter yourself and only yourself mm. not what yourself wants and that's really the, the difference because boy it's so easy to get in there in this experience of, of oh I'm that too then I should be recognized as that mm -hmm. yeah so you went from uh, you know all kinds of yearning and longing and seeking to a place of feeling full and not feeling you know the, that that yearning and seeking anymore. Um, was there ever a sort of a clear demarcation, or did it just sort of sneak up on you? And did you feel like something was missing? Like why am I not yearning and seeking anymore? Or did you realize that oh this is good, this is you know this is a, what I've been you know moving toward? No, it wasn't mature enough. Uh -huh. For me to to feel that this is good, I knew it was. I was on. I was on the right path, though. I mean, I knew that this was part of it. I was. I was experiencing the other side of the coin. Um, Did you feel you're becoming lackadaisical or something? Like, hey, where's my old uh, fire? You know, I'm just no I'm because too, I'm too content here. <laughs> um, love because love was still very present. Mm. Um, the love hadn't left. Love was still very, very and strong, very intense. Yeah. Um, and that's what my this being, you know, had experienced for so long. If that left, then I would be concerned. There was no, there was more of a um, a, a sense of completion. Um, there was now there was something else. Another door was opening. It was time to come back to the West. Um, the time with Amma was wonderful. She gave me. A, I wasn't burned out in any way. I should really say that. I. I I never felt like I was burned out with India. I would love to go back and visit. I just haven't in a yeah. long time. Um, as I think it's a remarkable place. Mm -hmm. But the the sense of this wanted to know itself even more through living it. Um, I hadn't. I didn't know though what had really taken place here. And I think that. Now, looking back, and you know, you always know by looking back in retrospect, I can see I needed to come here to get to understand what had taken place because I still didn't really know. Mm -hmm. And for us to really be on track, 
I feel the mind needs to understand a little bit of what's taking place. Mm. Um, because it actually starts to get on board. It actually starts to cooperate with the process. I think if you're it, right. I think, I think understanding has to supplement experience. Uh, yeah, 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 and I didn't. I didn't have that at that point. I didn't know what had happened. Um, it wasn't until really I sat, started sitting with Aja, that oh, he would say something to me and look at me, and it would go click, click. Oh, of course, and I would see it. Oh, of course, and everything started to really fall into a. a, a um, uh, how do I put it? This is something started to coordinate, um, work together, mm -hmm. you know, the mind and the presence. What attracted you to Adya? And did you feel any sort of um, loyalty conflict or something, you know, should I start running around with other teachers if I'm as my guru, was there any of that, or, or did you actually get explicit blessings to visit other teachers, or was that irrelevant? Well, um, I sat with a couple teachers first before I met Adya. Uh -huh. um, I liked it. I liked sitting in their presence. That was when the recognition, I could see that it was here, what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I, there was, at, at that point, I didn't know it, but there was really nobody here to say, oh, I'm awake or anything. It, it, it just doesn't happen um, when it's gone all the way through um, like it did here. There was nobody that said, gosh, am I awake here? There was nobody left to do that. Right. So, um, but sitting in the present, there was a recognition that, oh, there's, there is something going on. Mm -hmm. um, then this sort of a little series started to happen. One person asked me to get thoughts on. Uh -huh. I kind of laughed. I said, there's no way. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I Did was still very much my own reclusive person. You know, I wasn't used to a lot of people. And did you feel unqualified? I mean, did you feel like, why should I get up in front of a group of people and start yeah, talking I to didn't, them? I didn't know anything. Yeah. I had, what, what do I say? Right. <laughs> I, had, I had had no teachings. Yeah. No, I had nothing taught. So what, what, what am I supposed to teach? I, there's nothing here to teach. Mm -hmm. um, but meanwhile, this presence would when I would sit in the company of others would be just this overflowing love and recognition. Mm. So are you kind of saying that you had awakened, but you, didn't, you hadn't quite realized it, uh, and it was not until you sat with some Western teachers that it kind of dawned on you that this had taken place. Is that what you just said? Yeah, it's, it's not even, I, I wouldn't even call it I had, I had awakened. That well, concept, yeah, the terminology that is very clunky. That concept wasn't here. It uh -huh. just wasn't here. Mm -hmm. It was a silent recognition of presence. Yeah. And I would, yeah. When I would sit in presence with Pamela or Neelam, there was a like, oh, it's the same thing. Yeah. Oh, look at what they're talking about. And but of course, you had, had, you had noticed that presence ever since your very initial thing where you had gone down to, in, to the stream in Truckee and then gone off into the woods, the very same yeah. presence, right? Yeah, yeah. So what's the difference? Because they were putting it to words, mm -hmm. and I hadn't heard it in words before coming from that. I'm yeah. a never, you know, I never heard words. Um, and so my mind was starting to kind of say, oh, I understand Mm -hmm. what they're talking about. And could it, would it be fair to say that it had matured in you or ripened or become the, 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 the living of it, the experience of it had become much more full than it was uh, in those in very in early years through all this thing that you had been doing? Uh, yeah. I could say it was, mu it was much deeper. Deeper. Um, yeah. But I don't know if it was mature yet. Um, okay. We'll have to get to what we would yeah. mean by, by mature here. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the maturity, the understanding of what, what happened, um, I needed that first for the maturity to happen. Um, and that needed to be through a very, very eloquent 
teachings. Um, such as Ajahs. Such as Ajahs. He's helped right. me tremendously understand mm -hmm. what happened here yeah. and what's continually happened. Um, beautifully enough, the satsang that comes through this is also teaching this to understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in other words, you understand more as you teach it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, very yeah. much, very much. The teacher always learns more than the taught. <laughs> it's 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 wonderful. What a gift. Yeah, yeah. So. Huh. So so you would say that uh, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but I'm just saying this in order for you to respond and you know correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. Um, that presence is presence, but the depth to which it can be appreciated and the clarity with which it can be understood has a great range of possibility. Would it that does. Be fair to say? Yeah. Thank you so much for this is this is so important. Um, it has a great range. Um, awakening and this is one of the things that I'm hearing Aja talk about. If it's authentic, mm -hmm. if it's really authentic, goes through the whole personal. So that there's nobody here that has really any ideas about what it is. It's a lived perspective. It's not an experience. Mm -hmm. It's something that goes through to the point of <clears throat> you see through the personal completely. Mm. Right? It's the essence of all experience as opposed to being an experience. Correct? I mean, it's that by which everything is experienced. It is. It is. And, but it's also the first step, isn't it? It, it mm -hmm. It's in its area. What do you mean by that? Well, it's always something that we come back to, mm -hmm. looking from this presence, from right. awareness. Right. It's always something we come back to. It's very, very elementary. Fundamental. In the Fund el fundamental, right. Right. And so even though it happened 23 years ago, mm -hmm. it's still happening right now. Mm -hmm. Only what's happened is that from this presence, the inquiry is still is, is able to see very effectively there's still a structure in place. Not much, but there's still something of a self a small self that maybe has fear or maybe wants to hold on to something or maybe has expectations it's that doesn't fall away completely but from the perspective of awareness we just see it as nothing but a structure Do you feel that if it were to fall away completely, you would actually be able to function as a human being? I think we retain a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. But when we're very, very rooted in this presence of being, it doesn't fool us. Right. You know, and, and, and the ability to, um, to see it, of course we don't see it until it's here, meaning we're, it's in our experience. Yeah. Um, the, and the beautiful, the, the concept of the way to truth is through the illusion. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is so important for us to realize we're not in a transcended state. We're not in a place that we don't ever experience the structure. We're not in a place where the illusion doesn't come in and we experience a moment of um some holding or some sort of resistance or, or some sort of hope or anything like that, anything human, okay? But that, that structure, that structure of self as it passes through from awareness, we can see it and, to the, and how much we want to see it. You know, that's how, how honest we are with ourselves. And to ask a question, is there any self here mm. is there any holding here is there any resistance here is there any hope here any expectation here there are a couple things which come to mind one is that um, when I was 
trained as a teacher of TM. Um, yeah. Marsh, Marshi gave a long lecture about what he called Lesha Vidya, which means faint remains of ignorance. And he said that it's, it's necessary to have some faint remains of ignorance in order to function. And you, c you should never expect that that is going to completely disappear yeah. and that there won't be some, you know, kind of remnants or, or ten you know, human tendencies of uh, not that, you know, it's just necessary as long as you're in a body. Right. Um, and another thing he said in a different lecture, which reminds, which I was reminded of in the next thing you said, was uh, a phrase, I don't know what the Sanskrit is, but um, the world reveals Brahman. In other words, the, the, s the, the physical, the structure of the physical world is, is instrumental in revealing totality to us. It's true. I think it's, it's absolutely necessary. Without this, without this structure, how would we know ourselves? Right. We we almost need it. We need it to become more rooted in this awareness, this presence, and yeah. looking from awareness. We can't see. We need the duality to experience the truth. And stepping back to a much bigger picture, mm -hmm. why did the universe apparently manifest to begin with? What you know what. And who is this self that's getting to know itself mm -hmm. through this through the instrumentality of this whole universe and you know I in us as an individual in this little expression of the universe yeah and why would it want to stay in some sort of transcendent state i mean boring. to me it's boring <laughs> i mean you know you i love your title at the gas pump because right. it's so true we get to experience the rising prices of gasoline <laughs> and, our, and the noisy refrigerator, which I turned off incidentally, uh -huh. you know, and, and the, the plumber coming through the door and, you know, and the, and the concern for the lighting about with the web camera, you know, uh -huh. yeah. but all these little things that are part of it, Yeah. you know, and because we get to use that, we get to use that to see, am I trying to control my experience in any way to try to get to some sort of enlightened one mm -hmm. whereas really the true experience of of presence is in the middle of this human experience if we're trying to control it in any way you know it's not it right that cuz that's that's going to be actually the structure of the self trying to control all our experience hmm. yeah. Yeah, no, I'm following you. No, yeah. You know what comes to mind is that, I mean, when we keep saying we at this point, you know, what I keep thinking of is, well, really, I mean, if God is omnipresent, then th there's nothing but God, because if there's any place where he doesn't exist, then he's not omnipresent. And so, and yeah. so that, that we that we keep referring to, it's, it's, that is the divine intelligence, you know, speaking as me, speaking as you, be, <coughs> Excuse me, living as the dog, the cat, the plumber. <coughs> yeah, uh -huh. sp spray my throat again. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, and so all of this, this whole vast, complex, fascinating show, <coughs> is you know sort of Krishna's leela, so to speak. It's God playing in the diversity that He creates in order to have that entertainment. And sometimes it's a pretty dark movie, you know. It 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 may yeah. be uh, it may be Auschwitz, but um, it, you know it's not <laughs> always butterflies and pussycats. <laughs> but it's part of the whole diversity of the complexity. The um, I'm talking too long now. You you should. No, respond. you're fine. I no I no I enjoy listening to you. <laughs> I, I really do. That. do. Sometimes I get I get energized and I get carried away. Yeah, like now you know my dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> But you know the experience of it. When we speak, we're speaking from experience. We know this is true, yeah. and um, you know when we're in satsang, the awareness that everybody is of we're there's there's equal amounts of this presence available to all of us, mm -hmm. and to take that out into the world and to experience that everywhere all the time. There's equal amounts of this grace this presence experience uh, available to everything mm -hmm. to everyone to experience it it keeps everything kind of democratic you know yeah even and there is no hierarchy there's no more or less it's just 
are we available for it? I mean, it's that is really the question. Yeah. Mar Maharshi used to say the reservoir is full. It just depends on how big of a hose you want to hook up to it, you know, to draw from it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Little drinking straw or a yeah. great big fire yeah. hose. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just watched myself and... And the am I limiting this experience in any way by trying to want anything out of it? I mean, is this really a life coming from a limited perspective? We don't know. We don't know what's on the other side of that hose. We don't know what's coming through the hose, mm -hmm. do we? We don't know the reservoir that's back there right. that's coming through this because that's the life. That's the life. Mm hmm it's coming through. Yeah. I have an interesting question for you. This will change the direction slightly. Sure. Um, you know, you're you're experiencing this fullness and contentment and living presence and teaching satsangs and all. Um, and yet you just, you know, you, you drove from Ridgeway down to Albuquerque and then you drove all the way out to Iowa. I did. A, a two-day drive <laughs> in order to spend two, uh, two days with Ama sitting in the front row glued with your eyes glued on her. And then two days drive back to Ridgeway. Oh. Now, what would be the motivation for going to all that trouble and driving 2,000 miles um, if there's already fullness and contentment? Oh, isn't that a beautiful question? I can't answer that because I know, I know, all I know is I was called. Mm -hmm. When I went down to Albuquerque, which is happened to be the only time I see her all year, it's like my time to check in with my master, mm -hmm. who will always be my master. I don't ever want to lose that relationship. If I, I can't imagine that happening, maybe it will, I don't know. Um, but anyway, so I go to Albuquerque, and there was four days of program. Mm -hmm. I went with my girlfriend, and we said, let's just bring our camping gear just in case. Mm. Right? We had an idea we might come. We just mm. had an idea. Usually I don't go anywhere else on this whole seven-week tour. I only go to this one city. When we were done with Albuquerque, with the Devi Bob in Albuquerque, we went back to the room. And she came through the door, and I said, I, I think we should go to Iowa. She said, I think we should go, too. <laughs> and you, there's no, um, you know, who's to say why? But when I got there, I knew that there was some sort of something that wasn't quite, she wasn't done with me. There was, hmm. there was definitely, there was definitely um, a very um, deep, um, more letting go happening here. Letting go is the name of the game. Hmm. Sometimes we get to a point where there's a lot of ways that this can get hung up. There's lots of ways. There's a lot of places we can hold on for dear life because we just do not see anything more than more possible. And, and that's really where this goes. You hmm. just you get to a point where every speck of the end, every speck of what you know, you think you know, is 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 falling into this this heart that is just unknown. When I, this is where I've been. That those last few specks of known, they get. The structure wants to hold on to something that's known. Right? So oh. to go, I know you're here. I'm so listening, yeah. I know. When letting, I go. Letting dogs in and out. I know. When, <laughs> I, when I go see Ama, the love and the devotion that I have for her gives me the strength to let go of those last bits of known. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would be possible without devotion. And it doesn't mean that you need to be devoted to a master or to something, but that devotion is going to get tested and again and again and again and again. Devotion to truth, devo devotion to what you know is true. If I, that, to go see Yama, that love 
and the devotion that is here for her gives me the strength to let go of those last knowns. And it's not like the structure lets go of known. It's the awareness lets go of the structure that's holding on to the known. Does that make sense? I think so. So in, so in other words, you're saying that when you, when you refer to known, you're, you're probably referring to sort of in, ingrained assumptions or ways of thinking and so on that are um, conditioned and, and that are re restricting you, perhaps even without your being aware that they're doing so. And you're saying that when you sit in Amma's presence or focus on her for a couple of days or whatever, it uh, helps to root those out. It brings them to light or loosens them up or purges them or some such thing? Um, yeah, and it's almost as if, Rick, it's, it's that transmission of Amma mm -hmm. that is... Just works its magic. Works its magic. Yeah. It is part of the unknown. Mm -hmm. It is part of the mystery. You know, why do they call it a mystery? But it brings something conscious that is also, there is a holding. And to align ourselves with that which, it's like, I know where I'm going. And where I'm going this little speck of known can't go. Uh -huh. So in other words, you have a, an intuitive sense of where you're going, and yeah. You yeah. And, but the, the baggage that you're carrying can't, can't be taken there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the right, the luggage. The airline only the allows luggage. so many bags. <laughs> yeah, and it, where you're going, it doesn't allow any bags, actually. Right. You know, the eye of the needle doesn't, there's yeah. not too many bags that can fit through an eye of the needle. True. But and in, in this known, you know, you asked a question about what is it that's known. Mm -hmm. It can be anything. It can be like basic stuff like I need money or I need a place to live. Uh -huh. I mean, it can be that when we don't see past this moment and you can't imagine anything past this moment, it kind of puts you into a little bit of a predicament sometimes because you can't imagine what's next. Yeah, so I would regard those as assumptions, expectations, things like that. It's not like you're going to forget how to ride a bicycle, you know, something you know, but but things that imply or, or uh, you know, not s completely trusting in, in divine guidance or in presence or whatever, those are the kinds of things you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And this this letting go of the need to know. Right. Uh, right. The need for certainty. Yeah, the the needs for certainty, the need to know, the need to feel security. I mean, yeah. the, the, I mean the, there really is not such a thing. Right. But the the need, the structure of self, it needs I mean those are, the known is what the structure holds on to. Yeah. And it 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 thinks it needs to know. And I mean that's without those needs, it wouldn't exist. It survives on holding. In Zen, they speak of don't know mind, you know? Yeah. Probably heard Adya use that phrase. Yeah. And, and this don't know thing, it becomes basically what you are, not a, an, an unknown, an unknown presence, because it's, it's just being. It's just there's no known, but there's a sense, like you said, like an intuition that this is where it's going. It's going more into the unknown. It's going so deep into the unknown that you could never have imagined it would go so deep into the unknown because uh, you could never have imagined that the unknown was, was deep. so unknown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somebody I, I, I qu quoted in the Nisargadatta is saying that the degree to which one is sort of comfortable with paradox and ambiguity is a good measure of one's spiritual maturity. It does get tested hmm. to a great degree. If I, w I had no idea. So I, what I kind of hear you saying, I mean, there are a lot of people these days who seem to speak of awakening as, as a, like a, an on-off switch. You're awake, you're not awake, one or the other. 
uh, and you you were referring to it, I'd say, more as a rheostat. You know what a rheostat is? It's like those knobs you can turn, the light gets brighter and brighter, and um, instead of just an on-off switch. And you know, because what you're saying is, you know, you've I know terminology is is clunky, but there's okay. there's been a, a sort of an awake state for for some time now, but there seems to be a continual deepening and. Um, you know, enriching or whatever. And I mean, if you were to contrast yourself with someone like Ama, uh, <laughs> in terms of degrees of awakening, it would seem to me that, yeah, sure, it's the same presence, but wow, you know, there, there's an interesting example of, of how bright the bulb can get. Yeah, and, <laughs> and we have no idea how bright that bulb is. And that's, she's beyond even... I, I can't even talk about it. It's it. She, she just seems to me to be the source of the universe. That's, and I mean, when the experiences that I have in her presence always simply amaze me because they support you right where you're at, yeah. but yet they draw it out of you to the degree that I have never experienced possible with anybody else. Um, and you talked about this this light getting brighter. You know, of course there can still be a little bit of in out. It gets it's like yeah, brighter in a dimmer. Yeah, the brighter shadow in a comes and yeah, sure. Yeah. But the maturing is would be really would be the vacating of the structure. As the structure vacates this space, this vessel mm -hmm. or the known, which is the same thing. This presence, it's, it's like it moves forward. It moves, um, it moves forward so that it's very conscious of itself as it's living here. It, it knows itself. It's, it's, it's here, here this is. Yeah. And this is so what So when you say the structure vacates this vessel, what you're, what you're referring to, I think, um, is that, you know, as long as the, the ego is, you know, intact, um, then it doesn't. Then the, then the vessel is not as fit a reflector of that presence as it might be. Is that is that a way of putting it? It's more. It seems like it's to me. It's more like it fills up the space. You it, know it when it crowds out the, the it presence. crowds out right. Yeah. You know when you're in identification uh -huh. and you're just so convinced you're right or something. You know? Yeah. I mean you're so full of your shed you're so yeah. full of your known what you think you know right there's not a lot of space there then there's just yeah. what you think you, it's your your space your your vessel is filled with what the structure thinks it knows the ego thinks it knows mm -hmm. i know and this is right and i know it right it, there's that's that's filled and some people seem to they think that they're finding security in that you know I think, well, if I can really figure this out and come up with a theory and this is where that person is at and this is where this is at, yeah. you know, and so-and-so is wrong, and I, then there's a sort of a sense of, okay, well, I've got my world intact, I'm secure. Yes. But ironically, I think it's quite the opposite because you, you're on shaky ground as long as you think that way. Yeah, and that's, that's – I'm so glad that you as an interviewer are aware of that, um, this – to not – because we can't know where another person's at. There's, it's just not possible. Maybe Ahmed does, but to know another person's experience and what they're actually seeing from, and what their presence is seeing from within themselves. Mm -hmm. Right now, I, I don't know if I know that's possible for myself. Right. To know what another person is actually experiencing. All I know is what is happening here. And it's my responsibility to see what's happening here. Am I full of known, or is actually there a place of emptiness? Mm. Whereas, so that this this hose or this pipe can be clear and empty of known, and so that this presence can move forward. One of the experiences that I had, and I think you'll be interested in knowing this, when I was sitting with Alma, and I don't usually like to share this, but this was really neat. When I was sitting with Alma, being this and looking out through eyes, 
I could feel Amma looking at me and with her eyes pulling presence out even more mm. through eyes. Really bizarre. Nice. It's very, very cool. And she did that a few times. Just here in Iowa or you mean previously? It, both in Iowa and Albuquerque. She oh. just this 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 year though. Cool. Yeah. And you know, and I get the sense that, you know, what this thing you keep talking about of, you know, removing the vestiges of the known um yeah. it's not like it's i mean just to make sure people understand what you're saying it's it's sure. not like you're becoming a dummy in some sense or or that you're becoming wishy-washy like oh i don't know anything whatever do you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, i'm sure you have direction and and purpose and and you know you you can apply yourself with certainty when the situation calls for it can you not yeah you become more conscious that you're just being moved yeah. You're being you're being moved by something that's very very intelligent. Mm -hmm. That's um, one of the way, one of the reasons I still love to hike so much is when I'm hiking I really feel this. Maybe you've experienced this too when you've experienced presence moving your body, mm -hmm. you know, picking up a glass of water, mm -hmm. scratching your arm, moving your legs when you're walking, mm -hmm. um, talking, yeah, seeing. And the more conscious we are of being embodied, right? There's, it's not a dummy. It's, it's something that's quite. Um, yeah, I, I don't even know what word to put to it. It's something that's so tangibly intelligent, and wise, and compassionate. It can't go wrong. It won't let it you go wrong. I think that what bothers some people is that they, they get the feeling that what you're talking about is a, a loss of, of that which makes them special or unique or, you know, interesting as, as a person that, that you're going to become, be, become a sort of a, a colorless sap uh, yeah. if, uh, if you undergo the process you're talking about. But, you know, my experience of people who are living that presence very fully is quite the opposite. I mean, yeah. you know, Ama or Adya or you or just anybody who is really living that fully, they become more interesting, more vibrant, well, more, and, more animated. And, and, and just more authentic. Yeah. I mean, be, to be special is something that's imagined. We, you know, when we try to be special, we imagine what being special is, mm -hmm. and then we try to act the role, and it takes a lot of energy to maintain that especially when we're not feeling so special. Yeah. Um, that, that, taking, that takes a lot of breaking down, too, those sort of self-images. Um, in the long run, they're not very, they're not very satisfying. And, and to be really honest, am I trying to conform to my idea of what awake is or what specialness is or what spiritual is? Um, I've seen Amma act anything but spiritual. <laughs> I've seen her be very, very rough, uh -huh. um, but it was needed. Yeah. And then, then right on, and it was just an act. And right underneath it was, I mean, it wasn't an act as in a pretend. It was just um, presence playing a function in order to break somebody, crack them open. Mm -hmm. And then right after that is love and compassion. Yeah. Well, Christ in the temple overturning the money changers' tables, you know, he wasn't being all blissy there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. he was expressing anger and, and um, you know, being yeah. pretty, pretty decisive. Yeah, and, and sometimes this decisiveness, this ruthlessness is needed to crack us open. I mean, I, I experienced that. Um, yeah. to, to well, even our or even our regular earthly mothers, just because we get spanked, doesn't mean they don't love us. No, know? well said. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, presence or this vast divine presence that's everywhere, always, only wants what's best. Mm -hmm. It's it's good, and yeah. it's not about it's not about to hurt, but it knows what's it's so effective efficient when we really open up to it it's so efficient it, it it's got the right formula down yeah. you know and 
Well, you know, if you're a little kid and you get mud all over your face and your mother comes to scrub it off with a washcloth, you, you, you don't like it. You know, you squirm and you resist and you cry and you yeah. kind of push, push her away and everything. But, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be better off. And I have, I have the feeling that, you know, when you talk about stuff getting removed and all, it's just tarnish. You know, there's nothing of value getting removed. In fact, that which is most valuable will actually show up a lot more brightly when the tarnish is removed. Right, right. And if we come from presence, mm -hmm. if we watch that, and what is it that's resisting? And what is it that's holding on? And what is it that doesn't like it? If we come from presence and see that, I mean, we can really have some very, very profound inquiry going on. But if we stay in that place where we think we know what we need and what we think should happen, that's that's delusion. Yeah. And we have to be careful with this teaching. This teaching can be very, very effective, mm -hmm. that you are that. It can also be very dangerous. How so? Mm -hmm. Because it's so easy to own that concept. It's so easy for the individual person to identify with presence, mm -hmm. to identify with awakening. I've awakened. Ah. And to assume therefore that the deal's done. I know what I, I, I ha you know, this I am complete. There's nothing more to yeah. gain. Yeah. And so to, on and so forth. And to almost kind of build up new a new structure around that. Yeah. Uh, almost uh. a new parameter about what it expects. Hmm. Uh, so. It's interesting, you know. I almost a lot of times when I interview people, I I I always br I haven't needed to do this with you because you're saying it. But with a lot of people, I have to I bring in this point of well, don't you think there could be something more, some more progress, some, you know, greater clarity or depth or removal of inner you know hindrances and whatnot and a lot of them just ha they they do have this sort of on off black white sort of approach to awakening they say no i can't imagine any more progress this is it this is there's no one home there's and i just i wonder sometimes if, if such a person were somehow magically to step into the eyes of an, a, a ramana maharshi or an ama or something they might be a little bit startled by yeah. the contrast between yeah. what th the completeness that they thought they actually had right. a and what the potential is for <laughs> a human to live. I'm so grateful you say this. I'm, I'm really grateful. It's, it's, a, it's a touchy subject because a lot of people, they want to think awakening is it. They it's, want in, it to, it's endemic they in want the whole it. satsang movement it's these days. It's very endemic and it, they want it to be the final arrival and then they want the recognition from it. Mm -hmm. And my experience was with Ama, she didn't give a shit. <laughs> she didn't care. So what? You had an awakening. Now we can get started. Yeah. That's the foot in the door. That's mm -hmm. the first step. Yeah. From presence, you can see things much clearer. So that's the gift. You know, I love how Ajit says it. Awakening is a freebie. You don't need anything. You don't have to. It's, it's a gift. Once you learn to move from presence, then, then you can see the work that needs to be done. Hmm. Then, and this is what he says as well. I mean, um, he says that really to dismantle the whole structure costs everything. Hmm. The awakening is a freebie. Huh. To go the distance, to really embody this is going to cost everything. And so it's, it's like you know, the awakening is a prerequisite to, to the really significant dismantling. Yeah, and I heard him say in please forgive me if I'm wrong, Ajay heard him say that his teacher, when he had his first awakening, also told him, now we can start. Yeah, I heard him say that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is something that there is a maturing process that takes years, years. If, you, if somebody's had an awakening, it's a very, very important, vital, essential step. The essential shift is it ha it, it's so important, even if it happens for a glimpse. I've had people come to satsang that have had these glimpses that had, were not ready for it. They, didn't, they weren't ready. They were ready for the glimpse, but they weren't ready to keep going with it. Hmm. And so they just shut it down and went back with their life. 
and that was enough for them. Yeah, for the time being. For the time being, yeah. and that's fine. There's nobody that says once you had a glimpse, you should keep going. Right. Um, them there's there's nobody there's uh, it's hard to say who's going to keep going and who's going to just sort of hang out in a nice place when things get tough they can pull out presents and look at it you i know. think you know some people need a breather some people need to yeah. sort of just chill and and be be comfortable for a while that everybody can't do it the way you did it oh no It'd be a pretty crazy world. It would be crazy. <laughs> Somebody's got to hold down the fort. Yeah. <laughs> and thank goodness that I had a couple people hold down the fort. Somebody's you know? got to design webcams and create <laughs> Skype. And, <laughs> and tell me how to work it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I always need somebody around to kind of give me a hand with these things. Yeah. You know, and there isn't. Um, and, I, and for myself even, I've had to check in with myself and say, look, you know, Everybody has got their own design, and where they go is fine. I've, I've seen some pretty crazy things. I had one student that, um, bless his heart, he was, he was a little kind of bipolar, um, and he had a tremendous opening, mm -hmm. and very deep, very abiding. And for him, it was such a relief coming from where he came from. And so we let him hang out there for a while, an hour, uh, for about a year or so, and and I just started to nudge him a little bit. Okay, now you get to keep going. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't ready. And so he stopped coming to satsang. Mm. And and I had to let that go. Yeah. Um, I because I cared for him. He was very close, and he ended up about a year after that having an accident and he fell off he had a climbing accident and, and he died oh. and it was almost as if the, his the lifetime said okay this life is over it's done this is where you're going to stop so next time we can resume yeah right yeah. Sure. and i mean this is an extreme case but it, it's an it, to me i found it i was sad to lose him as a friend but i found it very interesting I don't think you're implying that if he had kept going, he wouldn't have had the climbing accident. I mean, who knows, you know? No. Uh, yeah. It's it's impossible. Karma is unfathomable. There's a, there's a verse in the Gita that what you just said reminds me of, which is that because one can perform it, one's own dharma, the lesser in merit, is better than the dharma of another. Better is death than one's own dharma. Dharma of another brings danger. Wow. That's powerful. Yeah. That's so, very powerful. Uh, and so everybody is, you know, I don't know whether everybody's in their dharma or not, but people are doing the best they can. People are doing the best they can. Yeah. And that's it. And, um, and the, it was funny because I was talking with a friend yesterday, and that's what we do. We mm -hmm. do the best we can. Yeah. And, and there's so much grace in that, mm -hmm. you know. Just to talk about that makes, it makes my being happy. You know, <laughs> it, is, it feels like, yes, exactly. Look around. Yeah. Everybody is doing the best they can right where they're at. Yeah. And it couldn't be any different, and it keeps it very interesting, too. It does. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's about a million more questions I could ask you, because I never run out. I mean, I, I could sit here <laughs> for, the, for the next, for all afternoon and continue doing this. Do we get a break? <laughs> but when we, get, when we get to about the two-hour point, I begin to think, all right, okay. we, we, so we better right. wrap it up because, yeah. you know, people are going to... People don't have the same attention span listening to this as they might actually. <laughs> right, when we're just in engaged in the conversation. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, before we close, is there anything, um, I don't know, whatsoever that you feel moved to say that we might not have touched upon? Um, no. Good. <laughs> It was pretty complete, I think. It was yeah, a, yeah. a nice conversation. It was wonderful. I yeah. thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. It's, a, it's kind of good in a way that we didn't get to do it when you were here in Iowa. And, I mean, that, that would have been fun too, but somehow there's, it's, this Skype thing works very well. In a way, it almost works better than setting up a camera and doing it in person. Yeah, once you get used to it, Yeah. once you get used to not being in, you know, you're there, it's almost like you, you, you're more you are there. Focused. You are yeah. there, and you're more focused, and this is all there is. Yeah, is this exactly. little box. <laughs> <laughs> Good. But then there's so, uh, 
Yeah, so let me just wrap it up by um, saying to people who have been listening that um, you've been listening to an interview with Joy Sharp uh, on this series we call Buddha at the Gas Pump. <laughs> and um, there are different ways of listening to it or watching it, but if you go to batgap.com, which is an acronym for Buddha at the Gas Pump, Bat gas pump. Um, you'll see all these ways. You'll see all the ones that have been done, and you can subscribe to an email newsletter to be notified of future ones. Um, there's a way of clicking to get it, to sign up for a podcast, and so on and so forth. Um, so do that. There's also a page there. Um, on, you'll, you'll notice a link on the right where it says upcoming interviews, and you'll see who's scheduled to be interviewed. And um, there's you can click there if you wish to recommend people. I often base who I interview on who's recommended to me. Um, so uh, that feel free to do that. So and also now you'll see um, a link to Joy's website um, uh, there on, on BatGap and uh, if you go to her website there's a section where you can read things she's written and this you can download hours of uh, audios of satsangs that she has given out there for free for free yeah and they're, they're very good I, I listen as i mentioned in the beginning i listened to a couple of them so if you like listening to this sort of thing i, I think you'll enjoy listening to joy's satsangs so thanks. thanks joy thanks rick i had a wonderful time yeah yeah well <laughs> we'll see you next time we see you at yeah some, maybe we'll make it down to albuquerque next year okay good I'll see you next time, too. All right. Thanks. Okay, Rick. Bye. Bye.